Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, The Future of Steelmaking. My name is Amanda. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Loosecope. Loosecope is a provider of innovative steel materials, product systems and technologies headquartered in Australia, with operations spread across North America, New Zealand, Pacific Islands and throughout Asia. Loosecope is one of the world's leading manufacturers of painted and coated steel products. With strong expertise in steel, they provide vital components for houses, buildings, structures and more. With more than 160 operations and sales offices across 18 countries, Loosecope employ over 14,000 people and serve thousands of customers every day, including engineers, architects and specifiers. Loosecope's strong partnerships and networks are built on their recognised product brands such as Colourbond Steel, Zincaloom Steel, Galvespan Steel and Truecore Steel. Today we will hear from our keynote speaker Justin Reid, followed by a panel discussion and our audience Q&A and encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box. I'd now like to welcome our moderator for today, Michael Ray. Head of Corporate Affairs, Australian Steel Products at Bluescope. Michael has over 25 years of management experience in an award-winning and qualified business professional with specialised skills in a range of corporate disciplines, including communications, media relations, reputation management, marketing, branding, government relations, community engagement, general management, MC and host. Please join me in welcoming Michael Ray. Well, thanks, Amanda. Um, and I'm coming to you uh, live from Port Kimberley Steelworks here, and this is Darawal country. Um, so I'd really like to acknowledge uh, the elders past, present and emerging as well. Uh, and as you can see from that kind uh, introduction from Amanda, that I have no engineering experience, so I'm absolutely qualified to moderate this session today. Uh, thanks to Engineering Australia for organising and hosting the event. And uh, it's our uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, I'd first of all like to uh, welcome everybody who's on, on the call today. So uh, thanks uh, for viewing and joining us today. I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker for today, and that is Justin Reid from Bluescope. Uh, Justin has 27 years of experience with Bluescope uh, across engineering, asset management, operations, logistics and major projects. Uh, he's currently the project director for Number 6 Blast Furnace Reline Project, which is a billion dollar project. Um, so please welcome Justin Reid. Uh, g'day, my name's Justin Reid and I'm here today to talk to you about the future of steelmaking at Bluescope. Uh, Australian steel products and the exciting projects that are currently underway within our business. Uh, Bluescap acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and operate. We'd like to acknowledge our elders past and present from the Darawal Nation where the steelworks operates today. The artwork on this slide is licensed works from local First Nation people. These particular artworks are from an artist, Jasmine Sarin. Jasmine is a proud Kamalori and Jirinja woman with a passion for Aboriginal culture and art. Uh, my name's Justin Reid, as I mentioned before. I am the project director for the number six blast furnace reline. I uh, started in 1995 as a BHP cadet at the Port Kemble Steelworks, and I've been working here for over 27 years. I uh, have experience in engineering, asset management, operations, logistics, and now working on a major project. 
Uh, for BlueScope, we have our purpose. We create and inspire smart solutions in steel to strengthen our communities for the future. We have an integrated supply chain from raw materials right through to finished products. You'll see our product in everyday places supporting our communities. Uh, we provide sporting stadiums to entertain people. Uh, we provide schools and universities to educate people. Things like livestock handling equipment to ultimately feed people and provide building products to ultimately house people. So Bluescape at a glance, we have about 14,000 employees across the globe uh, at over 160 different operational sites in 18 countries. Uh, last year we had a sales revenue of $12.9 billion and we effectively sold about 7.7 .7 million tonnes of steel. It is a global business, but in Australia, Bluescape has a national footprint referred to as Australian Steel Products. Uh, the largest division within the Australian Steel Products is the part I work in called manufacturing. Uh, Port Kimball Steel Works, it is the largest manufacturing site for Bluescope uh, within Australia. We're fast approaching the 100 year anniversary of steelmaking at Port Kembla. Uh, in this photo taken in 1928, you can see the little girl Emily in the foreground of the suburb that was known as Steel Town Heights. And in the background, you can see number one blast furnace in operation. The city of Wollongong has literally grown around the steelworks. Bluescope is committed to a future of steelmaking in the Illawarra region. Currently charting a course for the next 100 years, uh, including master planning for excess land holdings that are around Port Kembla. And I'll talk about that a bit later on in the presentation. Today we'll walk through a decades long transformative project or series of projects that pave the way for a long and sustainable future for the business. As a key employer in the Illawarra community, Bluescape understands that it plays a key role in essentially building that community. A role that requires collaboration with many key stakeholders along the way. This is the blueprint of our local ecosystem. Steelmaking is a huge undertaking that requires partnership and collaboration with stakeholders across the Illawarra and across Australia. We recognise that we have a role to play in a decarbonised future, which will involve transition to renewable energy use, the changing of raw materials, and increased use of recycled steels. Bluescape is a key contributor to the manufacture of Australian steel used to build renewable infrastructure, such as on and offshore wind towers, and solar farm componentry. Bluescape has plans to create a clean manufacturing precinct and renewable energy zone in the Illawarra to assist renewable energy use in the Illawarra region. This is a map of the Port Kembla steelmaking process. So if I walk through it, you can see the inputs of coal and iron ore. Coal goes into the coke making process, which eventually feeds into the blast furnace. And we bring iron ore in via ship through the sinter plant to make a feed called sinter for the blast furnace as well. We'll just watch a short uh, film about the blast furnace process. The vessel is under intense pressure. Valves are opened up at the top to allow for the regular and constant addition of raw materials, such as iron ore and coke. The heavy burden of these materials makes its way slowly towards the base of the vessel, where it is all melted by a blast of hot air. This air is blasted into the furnace through a series of 28 air jets, called tweers. The heat burns the coke and a chemical reaction occurs. 
carbon combines with the oxygen and leaves iron behind. The gas that is formed by the process makes its way through the burden and is collected at the top. It's a gas with a high calorific value. This means that it can be used to fire furnaces elsewhere at the steelworks and to make electricity. At regular intervals, tap holes are opened at the base of the furnace to drain out the iron product, which is now a very hot liquid. The blast furnace process is undergoing constant change to reduce the need for carbon and its impact on the environment. For example, the technology to add hydrogen as a substitute for carbon is under development, but can be retrofitted on number 6 blast furnace. We are also looking to install a gas recovery turbine system to generate power. Studies are also underway for the use of biochar a more sustainable source of carbon from forestry and construction waste. At Bluescope, we are busy planning for the future of steelmaking. Uh, so as you've seen from that movie, the oil that comes out of the blast furnace goes to the basic oxygen furnace, where it is converted from iron to steel. That steel is then cast into a slab in the slab making department. From slab making, the steel is then sent to the plate mill, and the plate from our plate mill goes downstream into many manufacturing businesses for further fabrication. Or the slab can go and be converted to hot roll coil at our hot strip mill. It is then passed into downstream businesses for metal coating and painting, and obviously produces our premium product, Calibon Steel. So, this is really the key slide of today's presentation. The opportunity in front of the Blue Scope team is shown across these three layers in this infographic. The top layer is manufacturing growth, the middle layer, is the property master planning and development that's underway. And the blue layer at the bottom is the decarbonisation pathway that we are working on. In the manufacturing layer, the first project is number six blast furnace. And that is obviously the Ruline project. It's a billion dollar investment uh, with over a hundred million dollars worth of uh, environmental improvements for the number six facility. Uh, we think it will create up to 250 jobs during the construction phase. We already have a team of over 80 engineers working on uh, this project right now in the design and implementation planning. Uh, Bluescape undertook open community consultation with an environmental impact statement around the reline of number six blast furnace. At the end of the public exhibition period, there were 400 and 42 submissions and 95% of those were in support of the project. And we're very, very grateful for the public for that level of support. Uh, Bluescap has since responded to those submissions and any questions that came with them. And we've now formally received approval from the Minister of Planning for the Reline project to proceed. And that's a pretty big step for us. The next project in the blue line is the metal coating line. Uh, this is an investment in our Western Sydney Service Centre. Uh, MCL7 would be the seventh metal coating line in our business. The intention is to build a metal coating line at our in-market painting facility at Erskine Park. The current strong demand for building and residential products, uh, we are investing in the order of $250 million and potentially creating over 300 jobs in the construction phase to create additional metal coating capacity in Australia. Uh, this investment will produce uh, over 200,000 tonnes of material that feeds our colour bond zinc alumin true core markets. The next project that's on this line is the renewables fabrication um, this is an investment potentially in the Port Kembla area. We've engaged with Wintel manufacturers to look at opportunities to set up in Australia to supply the domestic renewable wind tower requirements. 
there's some really, really awesome supply chain synergies associated with fabricating large items within the steelworks and then delivering direct to market. Uh, to achieve that, we have an investment in our plate mill, so the plate mill modernisation project. Uh, it's approximately a hundred million dollar investment. Uh, includes a new walking boom furnace and upgrades to the descaling units. Uh, this would result in approximately 40% reduction in emissions and a 10% reduction in water consumption on the current furnaces that we have. Uh, the scope includes new equipment for our downstream plate processing department as well. It creates an estimated 200 jobs. Um, during the construction phase. And earlier this year, we were successful in receiving a $55 million grant from the federal government as part of the Modern Manufacturing Initiative. This funding will help support the development of this project. And then that assists us with those renewable manufacturing areas, such as Wintown Manufacturing in the local precinct. The next major project is the pipe and tube mill. Uh, again, another capital investment, and this one is in the Illawarra area. Um, that project would enhance Australia's sovereign manufacturing capability and provide growth in supporting local demand for products that are currently imported uh, from overseas market channels. We estimate 35 full-time jobs could be created for ongoing operation, maintenance and support of this facility. It comes with some environmental benefits around more energy efficient equipment being installed and recycling initiatives where byproducts created in the, in the pipe mill process are collected and recycled back through to the steelworks. Uh, the final project on the blue line is the Commodity Logistics Project. Uh, this is an investment in the birth infrastructure of the Port Kimball Steelworks. It looks to secure the operation of these births for the life of number six blast furnace and could involve potentially a fourth ship unloader to improve the capacity of the berths uh, as required. The middle pathway, the property pathway, uh, is an opportunity to redefine the current land in and around Port Kembla and Kembla Grange. Uh, there's opportunities for light and heavy industrial use for the land, but even there are some residential opportunities that exist as well. Uh, the master planning works are currently underway to look at all of these options and determine what is the appropriate use for that land. The final section is the blue pathway, which is the decarbonisation uh, suite of projects. And the first project is a proposed hydrogen electrolyzer. So BlueScape are working with a range of partners to explore the use of a hydrogen electrolyzer in the steel making process. The hydrogen hub would include a 10 megawatt hydrogen electrolyzer. Uh, this proposed high Kembla project involves the installation of the electrolyzer to generate hydrogen for the use in three potential key areas. Into the iron making process, uh, as a natural gas blending, or as transport fueling. The second item on the blue line is a proposed direct reduction iron plant, DRI plant. Uh, this is in a concept stage and we've been working with Rio Tinto on this. Finding an alternate iron making process using Australian ores, Pilbara ores, uh, is, is a challenge and we're looking to use a melter between the iron and steel making processes. It will need quite a large amount of green energy uh, compared to our, our current energy use within the steelworks, but effectively would replace coal with hydrogen.
Uh, the third box listed there is an increased use of off gas within the steelworks. So this is an ongoing challenge for all steelmakers around the world. Uh, what is the best use of our indigenous gases that we create within the steelworks? And how do we get the most efficient use out of them? Now, we have a feasibility study proposed for injection of coke ovens gas, one of our indigenous gases, into number six blast furnace. Coke ovens gas is 60% hydrogen. So we actually have a hydrogen source available to us. We understand how it works and how it behaves in a blast furnace. Uh, the next project on the blue line is additional scrap melting. This is to increase the volume of recycled scrap at the Port Kimball Steelworks. Potentially up to 100 tonne of scrap per heat of molten iron being processed at the Steelworks. This would represent an increase from around 25% to up to 32% of recycled steel being manufactured out of the steelworks. And that recycling delivers a CO2 intensity emission reduction. Uh, the next project on the blue line is a look at the electricity infrastructure within the steelworks. To support a lot of these key projects, uh, we will need to have uh, a significant investment in our electricity infrastructure, especially as we move to more and more green energy. And the final box on the blue uh, line is biochar. Uh, so biochar has the potential to replace some of the current uh, coal-based uh, fuel that we use in the iron making process. We're currently working with the University of Wollongong and investigating some biochar trials on number five blast furnace. We need to understand how this material behaves uh, when it's being fed into the blast furnace with our existing pulverised coal. Uh, as you can see, there is a large list of pretty exciting projects underway within the uh, Australian steel products part of our business. Um, it's a pretty cool time to be an engineer in a steel making business in Australia. If you're interested in knowing more about what we've discussed, in February this year, Bluescape recorded an Engineers Australia webinar as part of this Thought Leaders series, where we went into more detail about Bluescape's sustainability pathway. As I've sort of covered today, Bluescape has several major exciting projects are required to deliver our ongoing growth. As highlighted, these projects are a mix of digital transformation, modernising our manufacturing facilities, and creating opportunities for customer growth. If you think you would like to be part of that journey, you can find out more by following us on LinkedIn or visiting our website. Well, thank you, Justin. What a great presentation and I, as always learned something new from you. Uh, it was very insightful uh, and really, you know, really exciting times to be not only part of Blue Scope, but a part of the whole steel industry and uh, and looking at you know what the future holds with so many great projects underway and uh, being planned. So thank you for that. Um, now we're gonna move on to uh, the panel discussion. So Justin's gonna uh, stay with us and joining Justin will be uh, Olivia Chan. Uh, Olivia is a graduate process engineer with Bluescope. Uh, she joined us earlier this year in 2022. So she's uh, starting off her career po post her uh, university degree. Uh, and she's working on the number six blast furnace reline project. So uh, welcome, Olivia. Uh, also joining the panel is um, Steve Shaw. Uh, now, Steve is a 35-year veteran in the manufacturing industry. He's held multiple project engineering director roles across a variety of industries. Um, he's worked for companies such as BHP, South32, Hatch, and also Bluescope. And his current position is as group leader of capital development 
and engineering globally for Bluescope. Uh, so welcome all our panel members. All right, well, we might throw to Steve now. Um, we've heard from Justin, Steve, around uh, a bit of background about his journey and career at Bluescope. Um, you've been around a long time. You've had a stellar career, and uh, I call you the our engineering guru. So uh, tell us a little bit how it started and, and your career path. Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks thanks for the opportunity today. Um, yeah, I've been back at Bluescope in my latest stint um, for the last three years or so, and uh, but I've actually worked in and around the company for the last forty years, and, and I started out at the Newcastle Steelworks um, as a mechanical engineering cadet way back in nineteen eighty two when we were still part of BHP. Um, and I spent most of my career managing major capital projects. And what I've found is that the, the training and experience that I've received at the Steelworks has really been second to none. And what that's done is um, afforded me the flexibility to, to move around, um, you know, at, at times when that suited my family and move into other industries when the need arose. And so I, I have worked in outside of the steel industry. I worked as, in an engineering consultancy. Uh, I worked managing projects in the energy sector for a while, and I've also worked in the mining industry. But really, what keeps bringing me back to Blue Scope is just the amazing range and diversity of um, work that we've got in the engineering field here at Blue Scope. It, it, it really would be hard to find anything like it elsewhere in Australia, as well as that range of engineering. We've just got so many exciting projects that we've got ahead of us. And, and um, uh, yeah, that's, that's what, what attracted me back here. And the other part of it for me is, and I think you'll hear this from anyone you talk to at Blue Scope, is a really collegial, family-like um, work culture that we've got. And that, that's a big part of why I love working at Blue Scope. And it's a company that's um, very community minded and serious about its social uh, license to operate. And, you know, I'm very proud to work for Blue Scope. And I suppose at, at Blue Scope, our purpose, which drives us each day um, and guides a lot of our decisions and what we do, our purpose is um, to create and um, inspire smart solutions in steel to strengthen our communities for the future and as justin outlined previously it's a really exciting time in the steel industry with with lots of new products being developed um, for example for solar farms um, uh, we're looking at developing a, a wind turbine manufacturing supply chain in australia so all the, the wind turbines that we've got going up around the country don't have to be imported and that's not to mention, you know, the opportunity that we have here to make a real difference um, through our R&D work on reducing carbon emissions um, from the iron steel making processes. Um, and the other thing I suppose that I love about Blue Scope is that our engineers just get to work on the full spectrum of the engineering process. You know, from the very start where there's an idea that ideation process, the pre preliminary sort of design work, prototyping, you know, full-scale fabrication, installation, commissioning, you know, uh, handover to the operation. It's it's a really rare opportunity to see that full range, and that was something that I didn't get to see when I was working in a consultancy, where you often only get to work on a small slice of that process. No, that's great, Steve, and thanks for that. And and look, 1982, a kickoff in the steelworks at Newcastle. I mean, you must have been five when you kicked off there. So, just a stellar career, stellar career. But um, look, and you're right. I mean, I spent a lot of time out in the community, uh, and you talked about the uh, that aspect of our purpose and and what we do. And I can attest to that that um, you know, the community shares our passion for what we're trying to do and. You know, it's certainly reflected um, more broadly outside of Blue Scope as well. 
seems like lots of exciting projects um, there for engineers. Well, I might just throw to Olivia now. And Olivia, being a non-engineer, as you know, I'm really keen and excited to understand what's a day in the life like as an engineer at Bluescope? Yes, thank you, Michael. So as you mentioned before, I'm currently working on the number six Realign project along with Justin. Um, I am the process engineer and I look after three of the sub areas of the blast furnace project, uh, predominantly to do with material flow both into the blast furnace and out of the blast furnace. Um, so some of the work that we are involved in is um, establishing design parameters. Um, so this is both for fluid and mass flow uh, objects. Um, and we also get involved with doing site walks and safety audits um, because the blast furnace is quite well established. Um, we need to be able to make sure that everything's up to date or the equipment is safe to be used. Um, Recently, I've been involved with a lot of process safety assessment work. Uh, and as you guys know, you know, we're working with a lot of new technology and with a lot of new technology, there's a lot of unknowns out there. So one critical part of a process engineer's role is just to be able to assess any kinds of consequences out there, both for your fellow colleagues and also for the wider community. Um, and as process engineers, we need to be able to identify and implement those safeguards. Um, and that's probably one of the really important parts of being a process engineer in a design project like the Realign. That's fabulous. I might have to uh, go back to uni and study engineering, come and work with you. I think that sounds fabulous. <laughs> uh, look, we might we might go to Justin now and have a look about, talk about, we've heard from Olivia about there's some great stuff happening on the Realign project and lots happening at Port Kimber Steelworks, but um, what other opportunities are there with all these projects going on? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, it's a huge opportunity right now within well, within the engineering group uh, inside the Bluescape business, not just for existing employees, but for people interested in coming and working for us. Uh, there's few manufacturing plants around Australia that have an engineering team like the Port Kimball Steelworks. The, the sheer size and scale of the operation here uh, allows for a real diversity of work to get involved in. Like, I've been here 27 years and I think I've changed roles every three to five years. I'm constantly learning new things. So there's roles focused on ensuring our operations are running as effectively as possible. Um, you'd work with people across operational engineering, asset focused teams and solving complex problems pretty much on a daily basis. Um, we're embracing opportunities to engage in digital technologies to speed up our ability to solve real data related problems. An example of this, the, the Realign project is actually modeling the rail activities within the Stirworks to predict the future state once number six bath furnace is back in operation. Um, I'll come back to those opportunities. The, the, the Realign project is an embedded contractor model. Uh, and so we allow our contract engineers to come and work on the client side rather than in a consultancy. Um, it, it tests everyone. Engineering uh, ingenuity uh, is always being trialled to see if we can develop really good workaround concepts before we move into the detailed design phase for the work packages of the project. Um, yeah, one of the things I really like about the way we've constructed this project is the engineers do get to work through the feasibility phase and we'll follow right through from concept to the end product. That, that will be there when we actually complete the execution of the Relon project. Excellent. Well, uh, sounds like you need about a thousand engineers or something. Is that in the next couple of months? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, we can certainly yeah. use lots of people. No, that's good. And now, Steve, obviously you heard there's a lot happening at Port Kembla and, and lots of projects there, but what about outside of Port Kembla more broadly? I mean, Bluescope's a big company, we're in 18 countries, you know, there's, there's obviously Australia-wide projects, but globally as well, what else is happening? Yeah, look, Michael, as Justin said, there's there's a heap of opportunities for engineers and, and technicians at, at, at our Port Kembla Steelworks and indeed our other operations in Australia. But you know, Blue Scope's a global company. Um, we're in 21 countries, I think, and 
you know, New Zealand, most of the major Southeast Asian uh, countries, also the USA. Um, in fact, you know, a large part of our capital investment over the last few years has been in the US where, you know, we've invested over $2 billion in, in new plant and, and acquisitions. Um, part of my role is, as you said earlier, is, is the governance of um, our project management of those major capital projects across the globe. And that gives me opportunity just to see the, the breadth of what we've got going on and, and it's massive. So if you work for Blue Scope, you're not sort of locked into Port Kembla Steelworks for life. There's opportunities right across the, right across the globe. Um, and we're looking for people for those projects right, right as we speak. Um, and I suppose closer to home, um, there's a huge amount of activity not going uh, going on, not just at Port Kimbla, but right through our businesses in Australia. Um, you know, we've got a, a quite a, a large number of operations across, right across um, all states of Australia. And, uh, you know, things like Orcon, um, we're building, you know, a new pipe and tube mill to um, make uh, components for the, tr the tracking devices um, used in solar farms. Um, we've got our LISAR business that's making a whole range of architectural and building products. That's got a whole lot of work going on and even our distribution business that, you know, services, the defense, the mining infrastructure, agriculture sectors, there, there's a lot of work going on there. And, you know, blue scopes are a very vertically integrated business where, you know, we start with raw materials like iron ore and you know steel scrap and we've got a whole series of processes and indeed a whole series of businesses within the blue scope umbrella that take that product all the way from you know a raw material to you know a, a component or a piece of you know um the latest uh, you know edgy sort of architectural sort of structures so it's it's a really fascinating and complex business and you know i there's, as Justin said, there's always things to learn. There's always different um, areas of engineering that you can you can work in, and just a huge diversity um, in, in the type of roles that are available. So whatever niche in engineering you may want to work in, as the chances are, we can provide you with that opportunity. Um, you know, you want to, as Justin said, we. If you want to work at the cutting edge of digital or get involved in data an analytics, well, come and join our digital transformation team. Um, if you want to get involved in the hydrogen economy, um, hydrogen production, hydrogen use, we're building a, a hydrogen ele electrolyzer on site at Port Kembla, putting in storage facilities, understanding how we can distribute the hydrogen throughout the works, um, as well as working with Syro and another separate company um, looking at the next generation of high efficient higher efficiency electrolyzers um, and you know you want to work on a whole new metallurgical process to make green steel well we've got that going on as well so and, and then we've got all of the roles involved you know across the full range of engineering disciplines um, continuously improving our manufacturing processes and developing new products to enable us to stay internationally competitive. Uh, thanks, Steve. And, and uh, Olivia, I might, you know, you've heard Steve and Justin talk about how much they've learned from the depth and breadth of experience across so many ranges of projects in, in the industry and at Blue Scope. Um, since you've joined at the start of the year, what sort of learning development have you experienced so far? Yeah, so I've been here for about six months now and I've already been through a lot of training courses, um, a lot of training courses internally and externally that the company is very willing to invest in you, especially as someone who's coming kind of fresh eyed, fresh from university as well. Um, one of the you know things that's definitely been met very apparent to me is that there are a lot of very experienced engineers and even though you might think that you're asking very obvious questions um, with obvious answers, 
there are a lot of people willing to help guide you through the technical development and uh, personal growth that you're probably seeking. Um, you know, professional and technical development is important for you no matter what stage in your career you're in, um, whether you're starting out like me or if you're more work experienced like Steve and Justin here. Um, but, you know, you get a lot of uh, opportunities here uh, at the Steelworks. As um, Steve said, the engineering community here is very close knit. You get a lot of networking events um, and you just get a lot of mentors and um, eventually you might grow into a men uh, you get a lot of, you might eventually grow into a mentor. Um, but you know you do get paired off uh, with very, very experienced engineers that can help guide you through what you need to learn. Um, and if they can't, which is okay, they can at least point you in the direction to someone who does know the answer to your questions or help you figure out how to um, get your answers. That's great. And I've got no doubt you'll make a great mentor in a couple of years as well. So uh, keep up the great work there. Justin, you know, just on what Olivia said, you know, your experience, you've been around the traps a little bit longer, as you said, 27 years now. Um, What's your experience about you know growth and learning and development um, in your roles you've had? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so like Steve, I actually also undertook a mechanical engineering cadetship. Um, I went to the University of Wollongong and I worked and studied at the same time. Um, I think these days I call them integrated learning programs. Uh, so I was able to apply what I learned at uni to that real world work environment, um, which is really the best classroom. And like the Steelworks has always been an amazing place to come and play as an engineer. Um, so then after graduation, I moved into a full-time engineering role. And sort of throughout my career, I've always had the opportunity to learn, stretch and test myself on the role I'm in. Um, sort of reflect on probably the biggest challenge in my career to date. Um, I guess I got to work on a, an issue we had at number five blast furnace where we needed to change the internal linings within the furnace. I was actually given the opportunity to go overseas and see how other businesses in the world had tackled that particular problem. Uh, the processes that I brought back really challenged or, or, or tested the culture and some of the safety norms of how we did things in Port Kembla. So, so I got to come back home and had a bit of a think about how we would go and implement that. That was the first time, it, I guess, it really stretched me as a leader to engage the team and take on those cultural learnings. But I knew I had the support and backing of our leadership to fulfill the project. And so when you've got that support or when you've got that belief in the leadership above you, it really, it really opens you up and allows you to go and work in places that I guess in some, some uh, environments, you don't get given that level of support. Um, and that project turned out to be quite a success. So it was a good news story. Uh, Olivia touched on sort of technical and personal development. I guess I've also been really lucky to be directly involved in the development of teams within Bluescope. Um, we have development programs that are focused on people development and working in teams. And we have a suite of training programs we call the essentials programs uh, and they're, they're really centered around uh, our employees and our leaders being given a, a set of tools to fulfill our purpose we really want to focus on giving our people the skills to work and grow together um, not just in the people space but also in their technical space as well uh, i'm pretty proud of the time we have invested in developing our people here at Blue Scope. Now that's great, and and I certainly remember that uh, those days with the Stave Exchange. They were, uh, you know, well done to you and the team. It was a, a massive engineering feat. I don't know how you do it, but uh, you solved the problem, and that was great for our, our blast furnace and and securing our future there. So well done, um, Steve. I wouldn't mind unpacking something you said a little bit earlier about, um, you know, what is some what makes some of the roles that engineering roles at Blue Scope a bit different and you know the complexity and the the size and depth and breadth of the scale of opportunity. Can you unpack that and let's explore that a little bit more? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose as an engineer at the Steelworks, you, you're working on such a diverse range of equipment um, and it's designed for a very demanding application with very exacting specifications. Um, and, and, and that ranges from like the heaviest of heavy engineering, um, you know, down to things like, you know, robotics and automation. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, Justin mentioned, we've got a strong program associated with the digital transformation of our business. So we've got a really wide range of engineering and opportunities for nearly all of the disciplines, but also the, the opportunity to see the project through the full engineering process, as I mentioned earlier. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the good things is, you know, you can get some very frank feedback from our operations people on how, how your design has gone, how it's working or certainly how it could be improved. And, and, you know, that's a real learning opportunity. So, um, and, and you know, for our people too, it's, it's really satisfying, you know, when you're driving home and you see some of the really cool products we make that, that are used in everyday life, you know, our color bond products for, for, you know, the domestic housing market, commercial buildings, um, you know, bridges and other infrastructure that are made out of, you know, the plate steel that we make here and, and all of that started life at the steelworks as a piece of iron ore. And, you know, you've, you've been part of that. It's very gratifying. No, that's excellent. Um, it is great to see our products all over the place. It, uh, I never get tired of looking at my roof when I drive home every every night. I've seen the old color bond uh, surf mist up there. In uh, um, And Olivia, we might go to you for one more. And Steve mentioned earlier about our purpose and our purpose is really what gets us out of bed every morning. And at Bluescope, it's about creating smart steel solutions to strengthen our communities for the future. How do you see what you do every day, your role contributing to Bluescape's purpose? Yeah, so yeah, it's um, as you touched on, it's really exciting to see the products as you drive around. Um, before I started working here, sometimes you wouldn't, you know, give second thoughts about what exactly happens to making steel and um, all the work and all the effort and everything that goes behind the whole process, which is really quite cool. Um, it's an incredible opportunity, especially now um, with all the new technology coming in to be involved in a really, really big project and um, understanding, you know, the long-term impact it has on the community. And, you know, especially for someone who's just started and plans to be here for a while, it's um, gonna be really, really cool to see how that all works out in a couple of years. Um, being on this project has really helped me get a good understanding on how the work that I do really contributes to making the sun, uh, the site run more efficiently um, and more importantly, quite safely. Um, it is a critical project to get Blue Scope ready for the future and I'm really proud to be a part of uh, the, the reline for the blast furnace. That's excellent. And, uh, you, you know, you, we look forward to you having a long and successful career at Blue Scope and hopefully you can outdo Steve and Justin on their tenures and join the 35 year club we've got here in Port Canberra. What about that? eh? that'd be pretty special, wouldn't it? Um, well, look, look, that concludes the panel section. Uh, but what, what we will do now is transition to, uh, over to you and we'll, we'll get some questions from, um, our audience online and, uh, we'll get your our, your panel to ask them so if you can pop your questions in the chat box um panel uh and ensure you provide your name and who your question is for and we'll get uh do our best to uh um, direct them to the right panel member to answer and we'll we'll go from there so pop your questions in now Well, we've we've got some questions that have come through uh, from the registration uh, straight early on. So um, we might direct the first one to you, Steve, if that's OK. Uh, we've got one from Stuart Snide from in New South Wales. Um, what is Blue Scope's strategy to achieve net zero in its operations? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, that's a massive question and one that really um, 
myself and many others uh, in the business spend a lot of our time working on at the moment. Um, we've actually, within Bluescope, uh, got a chief executive for climate change who reports directly to our uh, MD and CEO. And uh, Greta's got a team of engineers and um, technologists who are, you know, working on uh, a, a quite a number of different fronts. And you know, one the obvious thing is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, in our iron and steel making processes. And I might come back to that. But we're also working, you know, we we work in the building industry, so we're working to develop products that um, result in more energy efficient buildings and structures. Um, we're also working to increase the use of um, renewable energy. And, you know, we've got a, we, we've actually got contracts with a solar farm and a, a fair proportion of our power comes from that solar farm. Um, and, and we're also, you know, advocating more use of steel in, in uh, in products in, in you know projects going forward, um, you know steel is infinitely recyclable, and um, just using uh, you know our process of recycling steel through our process, it, it's it's one of the lowest carbon ways of um, producing steel, is rebirthing it in a, in a new form. So when you talk about uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, that that's that's a very big question. And our goal is to um, get to zero, um, net zero by 2050. And um, we've got some, some other goals along the way. We've got uh, targets for 2030 that we're trying to achieve. Um, but really the, the key to it is finding an alternate way to reduce uh, iron ore to iron um, that uses uh, hydrogen instead of carbon. And most of those processes that we're, we're looking at at the moment, and we've, we've got a concept study that we're working on with uh, Rio Tinto, um, that, that's really looking at a direct reduced iron process where uh, the reductant, the, you know, what actually strips the oxygen off the iron, iron ore molecule, um, is hydrogen uh, and not carbon. So um, there's a lot of work going on in that space. Um, we've just had a group of guys uh, do a tour of everything that's going on in Europe and lots of conversations with um, the uh, steel manufacturers over there to understand what they're doing. And we're setting up some collaborations with them because there's some things that we know how to do in this space that they don't and vice versa. Um, we're working with most of the major steelmaking OEMs to identify uh, uh, a series of technologies which will give us the best outcome in the context of Australian iron ore. Um, most of the iron ore that comes out of Australia is hematite, um, and that most of the projects that are being done in Europe and most of the early early winds that are being had in green steel space in Europe, uh, magnetite, different type of iron ore, um, and which represents really only about 15% of the global iron ore. Um, so we're trying to find a process that works with Australian iron ore, and that's gonna be a long and winding road with lots of dark valleys and elation when we get things right, but um, we're committed to that process and uh, we've got a bunch of people working on it right now. And uh, it, 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 won't be, it won't happen overnight. And, and it, it's not just blue scope here. We, we really need the support of the government because really what we're doing is substituting the energy that's in coal um, with electricity and that really electricity needs to be renewable. And just for example, as part of the DRI process, we'd need 15 times the amount of electricity um, that we currently use uh, in our in our iron and steel making processes, if we go to uh, hydrogen DRI, so we need we need good electricity infrastructure that's firm, available twenty four seven. We also need uh, the availability of affordable hydrogen. So there's a lot of other things that sit outside of 
what Bluescope's doing. We also need the right policy framework um, from from our governments. So it's a big it's a big question. I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, but um, we are committed to it and working hard on it. No, it's a big one, Steve. Thank you for that. And and there's quite a few um, carbon reduction, green steel uh, related questions. So I might just follow up with one that's uh, you might be able to expand a little bit more on. So one from uh, Athira Mohanan there from Victoria. How is technology going to affect the carbon footprint of steel making in the future? So I, I guess, what is that technology that's going to get us there, Steve? Um, so, so generally speaking, we're talking about a direct reduced iron process, which will replace the blast furnace. And as I said, we, we have to tailor the process to suit the Australian iron ores. Um, so really what we're doing is we're, uh, instead of using metallurgical coal, we'll be using hydrogen. And instead of CO2 as one of the, um, the emissions of the, of the, the metallurgical um, process, um, we'll be emitting water. Um, but uh, so that, that's really, the, the change in technology and uh, in order with with the uh, hematite ores we we're likely to have to put a few other steps in that process downstream of the DRI plant um, uh, to be able to process um, the Australian ores. Excellent thank you um, and lots of questions are coming through so that's great we'll uh, kick kick off uh we'll go to justin for the next one i believe this one's from alastair smith uh from queensland and it's how can australian steel making remain competitive in the global market uh, very good question there justin uh thanks michael uh yeah great question alastair um so we've been a manufacturer in australia for nearly 100 years and that's definitely had some ups and downs um we have a really strong focus on cost in our daily operations. And I guess looking back, that's helped us survive some pretty tough business conditions. But looking forward, how do we remain competitive? Um, we, we bring those, that culture and those behaviours with us. So we are constantly improving. We're always looking for new ways to remove cost or improve our operational efficiencies in our, in our process. Um, I guess we just see that as part of day-to-day -day business within within Bluescope. Um, the other thing, I guess, is in the Australian steel market, we do focus on producing premium products. So obviously, Colourbond is the is the top of our range, and we want to deliver the needs of the Australian domestic market. And I think we've right-sized our business to to do that. Thanks. Very good, thanks, Justin. Um, now we've got uh, we've got one here from. There's a couple here for Olivia actually about, um, you know, why did you choose uh, Blue Scope as a career path out of university? No pressure at all, Olivia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess for me it was a couple of things. Um, first of all, Blue Scope uh, it is quite a well reputable company with a long history. Um, and one of the biggest employers uh, of engineers in the Illawarra region. Um, I guess coming fresh, relatively fresh from university, um, one particular thing for me anyways, was um, being able to put into practice some of the theory that you learnt. Um, and, you know, as mentioned earlier, the engineering network is very close in Bluescape. So, Prior to coming here, I had met a lot of you know previous employees of Bluescope um, who had told me really good things about this place, and um, I guess you know I did a bit of reading on the Reline project, and you know coming here, um, I just decided you know this was probably a really good opportunity to put into practice um, some of that technical uh, learnings that you learn in university. So. Yeah, that was probably some of the main reasons that I decided to choose a career here at Bluescope. Great choice. Well done. Um, and welcome aboard. Now, 
this one's probably, we might go back to Steve for this one. Uh, can you do something to look into uh, using the waste gas, which is currently flared at the Port Kembla Steelworks, but perhaps a gas to liquids plant? That one's from Dominic Carolyn and from New South Wales. And the previous question I should have said was from David in New South Wales. So Steve, over to you on that one, flared gas. Yeah, sure. Look, um, we we produce three gases as byproducts of the iron and steel making processes. Um, coke ovens gas from the coke making process, blast furnace gas from the blast furnace, and what we call our Lintz Donowitz gas from the steel making um, process. Um, we capture the coke ovens gas and the blast furnace gas, and we uh, they're combustible gases with a fair energy content and we reticulate them throughout the works and they're used um, in other uh, processes in the steelmaking um, sort of uh, landscape uh, at Port Kembla and uh, the gases, uh, the surplus gases there are then uh, harnessed in uh, some boilers um, where we generate steam and we make electricity. So we try, we try and be as uh, self-sufficient in, in electricity as we can be. Um, and we use those gases to, to the max, maximum extent to, to generate electricity and make sure we're not wasting any, any of them. We do have an opportunity with the gases from our uh, steel making furnace, which it, it's a batch wise process. So you get a big lump of gas and then there's nothing for a while and then another lump of gas and nothing. So it's a very, it's a very hard gas to manage. And we've been looking for years to try and find a viable um, use for that gas. And we are still doing that. Uh, so we've, we've got a, a number of opportunities there. And, you know, in, we've looked at uh, the possibility of making methanol out of that gas, um, but it was, be honest it was very hard to make that um you know an economically viable project but we're, we're continuing to look at ways of, of harnessing um our gases and and um maximizing you know the the recycling of those gases through our existing processes thank you steve uh another one for justin here coming through what are the future scope in the steel industry for a professional mechanical engineer from Sunny Patel from Asia. Justin. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sunny. Excellent question. As a mechanical engineer, it's a great place to work. Um, look, it is a pretty exciting time uh, to get involved in the steel industry um, within Australia, but equally globally. Uh, the next what, the next 10 to 20 years is going to be a real key time of change as the decarbonisation of steel manufacturing is sort of tackled on a global scale. Um, we're an international organisation. If you're in Australia, there's plenty of opportunity to come and work as a mechanical engineer. Um, yeah, just jump on our BlueScope website and look at the careers. Um, but equally, globally, um, we're a global company. If you're overseas and interested in working for BlueScope, Again, you can go to our BlueScope uh, corporate website and follow through to the careers link. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Justin. Um, uh, probably another one for Steve here, a uh, bit related to the, the Green Steel conversation. So, Steve, this one's from Hilton Solium from South Australia. In the future, how will steel be made without the use of coal? Uh, interesting question. on. Uh, the, uh, the, I guess the chemical formulas and the science behind it. Yeah, sure. So, so look, just to be clear, you know, steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. So you're always going to have carbon in steel, but the question is, how do you do that in, in you know, a low emission or as a, you know, a net zero way? Um, so. Even into the future, if we if we go to a hydrogen-based uh, steel or iron and steel making process, we're going to need some carbon in there. And for that reason, you know, we're uh, working, um, looking at uh, biochar, and um, we've actually managed to get our hands on about six hundred tons of biochar, and we're working with the University of Wollongong. 
um, to trial uh, biochar and its use in the iron and steel making processes. So I suppose the answer is hydrogen is a big part of it, but also looking at biochar for the source of carbon, uh, you know, a sustainable renewable source of carbon um, that's necessary to actually create steel. You and uh, probably a follow-up one on a similar topic from William Bars from Western Australia. Uh, the technology exists, so what is hindering the progress to no longer use coal in producing steel? So I think the question is, why can't we go faster, quicker? What's what is the yeah. what's hindering us, Steve? Yeah, well, as I said, there's a lot of R and D we've got to do on developing uh, an iron making process um, for the Australian iron ores, and, and we're working actively on that. Um, but, you know, um, one of the main processes um, that that's used there is like the Midrex process, and that, that started development way back in the 1960s. And, you know, 50, 50, 60 years later, we're just starting to use that technology and it's starting to become uh, economically viable and so to then transition that technology to hydrogen it just doesn't happen overnight it's 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 quite a challenge so we've got to get the right technology um, as I said before we've got to have access to affordable and reliable renewable energy um, you know to to firm up um, you know a megawatt of uh, renewable electricity such that you know it's available 24 7 you actually need about five megawatts of installed capacity and as i said or five to seven and as i said you know we're going to have to increase the amount of electricity we import into the steelworks by a factor of 15. so you take that 15 and then multiply that by five to seven and that's the that's that's just gives you an understanding of the scale of renewable energy we're going to need and of course We've got to have all of the transmission infrastructure and you know substations and everything to get that from where it's made, maybe over the Great Dividing Range and bring it uh, down to um, Port Kembla. So access to affordable, reliable, renewable energy, um, that's and that's happening quickly, um, but it's still going to be years away until we've got you know the volumes that we require. Um, competitively priced hydrogen. Um, you know, hydrogen at the moment, um, we, we're building a hydrogen electrolyzer or proposing to build a hydrogen electrolyzer on our site here. Um, you know, that'll produce hydrogen at, at somewhere around $12 to $16 a kilogram. Really, to get it to the point where it's competitive, we've got to get that price down to, you know, somewhere around $0.80. Cents. So, um, you know, there's that. Um, we've got to make sure we've got the, a continuing supply of quality um, raw materials um, that are suited to the, the processes for green steel. And of course, and probably most importantly, we've got to have the public policy, you know, the government support that um, helps us with the massive investment that we'll have to make in that transition. Um, steel, iron and steel making is probably one of the most carbon, uh, capital intensive um, industries around, it, you know, there's a lot of money tied up in, in what we do and to transition from, you know, our tried and proven blast furnace technology to the new DRI technology, it's going to cost a lot of money and we're going to need some support to do that. Yeah, you kind of scratch your head when you, you look at the, um, the size of the, the amount of renewable electricity and energy we're going to need to make the transition. So it, it's... Uh, it's going to take everybody working together to make that help with that transition. Um, next question for Olivia. Uh, so this one comes from Andy from New South Wales. Olivia, what is it like working in a steelworks? Is it a male-dominated workplace? Um, yes, thank you, Andy. Um, yeah. Uh, Look, it was definitely one of the things that I noticed when I started working here that, yes, there's probably a big male-dominated workforce here. Um, that's definitely not to say that there aren't any uh, female engineers or senior female engineers for that matter. Um, I do know for a fact that the Steelworks are actively trying to recruit more female engineers into this workspace, so hopefully um, it's not going to be as big of a noticeable thing when... 
uh, young female engineers like myself start up. Um, and, you know, I think probably what's more important um, to know is just, you know, the steelworks are actively helping create opportunities for, um, you know, for people to interact with each other and provide some of that life mentoring if you do find yourself in any kind of pickle in that aspect. Um, but, you know, so far for myself anyways, I haven't really experienced any trouble um, as far as, you know, everyday kind of work-life culture here. Um, yeah, you know, people treat you really politely, respectfully. It's nothing too special to know about being, you know, a female here. Um, and yeah, look, I think it's just probably more important that in a couple of years that it's probably not going to be a noticeable thing. And I think that's a really cool thing um, that the company is trying to do here. Excellent. Excellent. So we've got lots of questions coming through. And look, I just a shout out thanks to everybody online. Um, I'm told there's 900 people who registered for today and, and watching. So I hope uh, you're enjoying it and getting something out of uh, hearing from our engineering team on the panel. Uh, a few questions coming through. I'll just some of them might we might have already answered. So, uh, Paul Lee from New South Wales, are you planning for green steel production instead of fossil fuels to generate electric, electricity for the furnace, uh, perhaps using renewable energy? I think the answer is yes and yes, and I think Steve covered that one off previously. Um, let me just flick through. There's a question here about focus on building Australia's naval fleet. Uh, Blue Scope supplying the steel. That's from Chris Davies from Tasmania. I think, again, short answer uh, on that one is uh, yes, we are. And we've pretty much been supplying steel for various um, naval vessels uh, back to the Collins class submarines many years ago. So um, we are quite often, you know, it's a pretty uh, quality controlled process to to making vessels and we do that and do that really well so again short answer to that one is uh, yes we are um move down uh it's another one for steve are you considering dri process besides or instead of the blast furnace that's from vahid nadiran and like uh, steve i think you've probably covered that one as well that uh, we definitely are looking at doing doing that dri pilot project uh, with our partner Rio Tinto, um, and whilst in parallel we we do the reline on the blast furnace. Uh, Justin, there's one here for you about the reline project itself. Um, this is from Amir Hamden. Uh, what, Justin? What is the reline project all about, and what is it aiming at achieving? Um, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Amir. Good, good question. So, I guess. Port Campbell Steelworks currently has two blast furnaces on its site, um, which isn't typical. We have one operating and one on standby. So number five blast furnace is currently in operation. It has uh, an operational life that will end based on the wear on the internal wear linings. Um, so we will prepare number six. Number six blast furnace actually operated from 1996 through till we closed it down in 2011. And it requires a refurbishment essentially to prepare it to, to operate again. So the reline is scoping up these repairs uh, plus a series of future improvements that we intend to make. Um, we plan to invest over $100 million in environmental improvements to number six blast furnace. Um, and overall, the project is in the feasibility phase. So we have a team of about 100 people, um, predominantly engineers who are working through uh, quite a few packages of work, scoping up what are the repair and what are the replacement scopes for the blast furnace to prepare number six for operation. Our aim is to execute those scopes of work and be ready to operate in mid 2026 so that it's on, on it's pre prepared and online, ready to go um, ahead of the end of number five's operational life. Thanks, Michael. Excellent. And there's a related question here, Justin, that probably follows on nicely from Hilton Solion. Um, what is the anticipated life of the reline? Um, yeah, so good question, because obviously it's a, it's a big project. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to reline a blast furnace. Um, 
as technology grows, the 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 life of the blast furnace actually improves over time. Um, number six blast furnace operated for over 14 years. Uh, number five blast furnace in its previous campaign operated for um, around 17 years. Uh, we are intending to get a 20 year campaign out of number six blast furnace. Uh, so that's the that's the scale or magnitude of the operational life that we will get out of executing something of the you know, magnitude of a blast furnace relaun. And a related question too, Justin, on that one. So what type of materials are usually used for the relaun itself? And uh, yeah, uh, hmm, there's quite a few materials that go into a blast furnace. The, the half, the, the crucible in the base of the furnace that holds the liquid iron is a refractory material. Um, it's a, a carbon-based refractory. The internal wear linings, the staves inside the furnace, there's, there's a couple of different styles of linings that you can buy for a blast furnace. Um, there are water-cooled elements, so they protect it from material abrasion and they also protect it from the heat of the process. Um, there's a lot of steel used in the rail on the actual pressure vessel of the blast furnace itself is steel. Um, yeah, so effectively a lot of steel, some refractories in and around our stoves and cast house floors. Um, and there will be some civil construction uh, associated with some of the newer parts of the plant as well. So some concrete going in as well. I guess they're, they're fundamentally the major materials used for the, for the rail on. That's great. And while I've got you, Justin, um, you must have piqued Andy's interest earlier about working for Bluescope. He's got, sounds great. How do I find out more about working at Bluescope? Yeah, absolutely. Andy, you should, should apply. You should come and work at Bluescope. Um, there are, there are a careers, there's a careers website. Um, if you Google careers at Bluescope, uh, it's not hard to find. And all of our open um, roles within the business are up online. So absolutely jump on the Bluescope. Um, if you're in Australia, jump on the Bluescope Steel website and look at the careers element in there. Excellent. Um, and this next question comes from Michelle in New South Wales. Um, what is an example of a Bluescope community project that has occurred in the Illawarra region? Now, when I look after the community, I might have a crack at this one, if you don't mind, panel. Um, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes, but uh, there's a couple of examples I can point to uh, that uh, that we've got. Uh, we've been doing, we have a partnership with Win TV, the Win Network, um, so the Blue Scope Win Community Partners Program, which has been up and running now for 10 years. Uh, it's, it's a $5 million program that we funded over the last 10 years. Um, and we've support somewhere around the vicinity of 70 community groups every year, uh, not-for-profit community groups at a grassroots level. Uh, and, you know, there's a criteria for that. Um, there's two rounds of funding every year. It's been really successful in supporting, um, you know, lots of different groups from, you know, uh, Illawarra Junior Life Saving, um, you know, Wollongong and Steadford, uh, the Southern Scars, Star Schools, Pet Spectacular, Careers Expos, the Disability Trust, a whole range of different, um, uh, you know, really grassroots community, needy, not-for-profit groups that we've supported during that time. Uh, right now, actually, I just came back from a, uh, this morning, a, a workshop we had for another community project, which is our local uh, aviation museum, the Haas uh, Aviation down at Shell Harbour Airport. And a team of Blue Scope people have been working on that project for a couple of years, you know, in kind pro bono, basically sharing our skills um, and across the broad, whether it's in marketing, branding, in, uh, you know, architectural design or pavilions, engineering, structural engineering. In fact, um, some of uh, Justin's team actually have just were participating in the uh, in the workshop to look at how do we build some of these new architecturally designed pavilions and make them, you know, making sure the structural engineering of them is and the constructability of the the uh, the new pavilions are, are are possible because they've got a 
you know, the Jumbo 747. They've got the John Travolta's 707 plane coming next year. Uh, so they're running out of room and they need some of these uh, um, extra pavilion space to, um, to help them be a tourism destination of choice and be a sustainable not-for-profit organisation going forward. So you know, just a couple of uh, examples of what we do there. We, we do a lot in the, in the local community. Um, one come through here for Steve, I think. Uh, how much leveraging of engineering skills occurs across the Blue, Blue Scope global foot, footprint? There was no name on that one, um, but Steve. Yeah, sure. That's that's. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah. So, out of uh, our, you know, the engineering hub we have at Port Kembla, we support a lot of our businesses and uh, members of my team have recently been working over in the US, uh, regularly working in Asia. Um, you know, when we're doing, you know, we're doing some work in New Zealand at the moment. And uh, as part of that, we're bringing people over from our US business who are specialists in electric arc furnaces. We're looking at installing an electric arc furnace in uh, at New Zealand Steel to help reduce CO2 emissions. Um, so that's that goes on regularly. And um, uh, I've got a number of members of my team who are just focused on, on promoting that uh, global networking and uh, sharing knowledge right across the business. Fabulous. And um, one question here from Presby Sensels, uh, probably another one for you, Steve. Um, Blue Scope, can, is Blue Scope considering circular waste economy? And if so, what are the aspirations? Yeah, well, as I said, um, steel, is one of the few infinitely recyclable products. So we are always trying to promote, um, you know, the circular economy. And one of the ways, one of the easiest ways we can reduce our CO2 footprint is to increase the use of scrap in our process. And we've got quite a number of projects going on to uh, increase um, the amount of scrap that's that's fed into the process to reduce CO2 emissions. and so we're very keen to promote the circular economy. Um, if people want to un understand more about that, they can have a look at our uh, sustainability report. We just actually released our latest sustainability report and it, it talks a lot about the, um, the circular economy and, and how um, steel can be part of that. Yeah, so very, very much part of what we have, do. Just happen to have one here I prepared. Please look at that. Yeah. I would recommend, though, that you, uh, you, you, you read the summary version. It's a lot quicker. Uh, so we, we're making life easy for you. Can we? Yeah. Can I just jump back to your screen, Steve? We've only got we, – we're nearly coming to the end of our time and, and we've got a hard end at 2.30, so we've got one more question to come up. But I just wanted to point out, Steve, if we could just zoom in, in on your your screen there. We've I really like – this is what I would see as a typical engineer's office here with the – the whiteboard scratchings in the background. Is that a couple of formulas and solving the world's problems? Is that right, Steve? Is that how it works? Yeah, I probably should have cleaned that before the webcast, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff on process safety there, Olivia. You'd be pleased to know. I, th I think it looks great. It looks very authentic there. And, you know, uh, you don't want to see what's on my whiteboard. But uh, look, the last question I've got for you is uh, I think it's related to. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which one it's related to, but it's um, a question from Ash Mugel. What is the overall con conversion efficiency of the process? I'm assuming we're talking about the the DRI process. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on which process there, Ash, but uh, I'll see if Steve can have a crack at answering that one anyway. Oh, look, th that's, a, that's a pretty difficult question to ask because to answer because it, it's it's such a convoluted process so I'm not even going to guess but that's I could uh, find out from one of our metallurgists and, and get back on that one but uh, I yeah I wouldn't like to try and answer that question myself that's just not part of my area of expertise that's that's one of our metallurgists that's all right well we'll take that one on notice hey how about that but look um, that's really all, all we've got time for today and um, 
we're out of time. And but thank you so much to the three of you, the panelists. So to Justin, Olivia, and Steve for your expertise and insights. You know, I've learned a lot out of it and enjoyed it. So I hope the nine hundred uh, people watching have, have equally enjoyed it as well. Thanks to all for your participation and for joining us today. Those online, we really appreciate it. Um, uh, a big thanks to Amanda and to uh, Engineering as Engineers Australia for hosting the event, but also for inviting Bluescope uh, and providing us the opportunity to come on and, and talk to you today. So hopefully, hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, I've been asked to give a shout out to please complete the feedback form. Uh, there's a link in the description box, box below, I believe. So please do that because it really does help uh, the Engineers Australia team and Amanda for putting on future events and what we can do better in the future. And um, look, thanks again. Um, we hope to see you at the next uh, Thought Leaders event. So have a great afternoon. Thanks all.